Awesome. And then, good. All right, here we go. And there we go. All right. So uh, welcome to, to today's uh, Rain Barrel Workshop. This is hosted by Rockledge Gardens. And my name is Nicole Broquet, and I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator here at the Marine Resources Council. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a couple of introductions to our upcoming events. Uh, this coming Tuesday, we have our Lunch and Learn webinar, which is going to be the three R's uh, with Recycle Brevard. So we'll be focusing on reduce, reuse, recycle, and hard to recycle or dispose of items. And that'll be from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, this coming Friday and Saturday, so uh, September 4th and September, or September 5th, uh, we have two different events. Uh, we have the Ogali Arts District First Friday Art Walk, um, and we will have Life on the Lagoon Art Exhibit. Um, and then on Saturday, September 5th, we will be having a, we'll be participating in an end of year, uh, or excuse me, an end of summer celebration uh, with Top Notch Marine uh, in Melbourne. And all the proceeds um, from the Lagoon or the Marine Resources Council uh, tabling area will go to our citizen scientist program, Lagoon Watch. Um, then coming up, if you're interested in doing some volunteering and get out there um, and you're tired of quarantining, please sign up uh, to join us for our storm drain marking events, um, which will be from Wednesday, September 9th to Saturday, September 12th. And there'll be two different morning shifts from 7.30 to 9.30 and then 9.30 to 11.30, where, we'll, where we will be going around different uh, neighborhoods in the city of Melbourne and marking storm drains to raise awareness about the impacts of what goes down our drain can lead into the lagoon. Um, and then we will also have more opportunities to mark storm drains uh, from September 15th to the 18th and the 22nd to the 25th, but those are not yet scheduled. So stay tuned for those. Um, also, uh, we will be having another uh, webinar that is hosted by Rockledge Gardens and it'll be focusing on the mighty mangrove. Um, and we will be teaching you all how to start your own mangrove nursery uh, in your yard and the different kinds of cares and restoration things that you can do with mangroves. Um, and that'll be from 1 to 2 p.m. and that will also be a webinar. Um, and then Saturday, or Saturday, September 19th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, we have the International Coastal Cleanup where we have signups available online um, on our website. And then there, we will be focusing on cleaning up three different causeways. We're not taking on one, we're not taking on two, but we're taking on all three. We're taking on uh, Melbourne, O'Galley, and Panita. And so we need a lot of help. And so if you're interested in participating in International Coastal Cleanup, please check it out on our website to sign up. Um, and then our last event coming up in September, it's a busy month, I know, um, will be on Saturday, September 26th from about 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And there'll be a National Estuaries Day celebration. And we're going to have a panel of experts. Um, we will have uh, a, the new health of the lagoon update with added tributaries with Dr. Lisa Soto, the executive director of the Marine Resources Council. Uh, we will also have uh, Dr. Dennis Hanasak, um, uh, and he will be focusing on the land and ocean uh, Biogeochemical Observatory Advanced Water Quality Monitoring Units, and as well as the Weather Sensor Network. Um, and then we have Captain Rodney Smith, uh, who will be presenting his uh, new book um, uh, called Pure Agua, uh, and it'll be the premier book release and educational and entertaining dive into Florida's water crisis. All right, so those are all of our events coming up in the month of September. Um, and uh, just for those of you who are joining now, my name is Nicole Broquet, and I'm the Environmental Education Coordinator at the Marine Resources Council. And we are here for the virtual Rainbow Workshop. All right, so for those of you who do not know who we are, um, we are a small nonprofit organization um, and we operate out of this big blue building off of Highway 1 down in Palm Bay. A lot of people drive by us and don't know who we are, what we do, um, but we are dedicated to protecting and restoring the Indian River Lagoon through science, restoration, and education. 
I won't go into these too much, but I just wanted to show some of our science programs. Um, we are still able to operate Lagoon Watch and Groundwater uh, through the COVID pandemic. Um, our Lagoon Watch program is a citizen scientist program, um, which tests for different water quality parameters throughout the lagoon. And then our groundwater program tests the groundwater, the different nutrient loadings throughout the county. Okay. And for our restoration, we definitely focus primarily on mangroves um, and we have planted over a mile in 2018 and we're going to plant uh, almost 900 feet this year um, and so unfortunately we haven't been able to have our monthly workshops due to the pandemic um, but we're hoping uh, you know as soon as we get the clear to do it um, hopefully we'll be able to have some volunteers out there and working with our mangroves again and of course we do education um, our Lagoon House is still closed to the public. However, we are doing a lot of virtual programming. Um, if you are a teacher or know a teacher, we have free virtual learning programs that support Florida State standards, and you can get more information about our um, virtual learning programs online on our website. Okay, uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, um, I wanted to do a small introduction about the Indian River Lagoon. So it's more than 30% of Florida's East Coast, which is a huge area. And this pop-out box kind of shows you the Indian River Lagoon in its entirety. And there's Brevard County. Um, and the entire lagoon is 156 miles long, which is almost 3,000 football fields in length, or basically going to Disney World and back in one trip. So it's huge, it's massive. And because it is so big, uh, it supports more species than almost anywhere else on Earth. Over 2,000 different species of animals and over 2,000 different species of plants. And it was able to support all this life because it was once a naturally resilient system. And this was due to its abundant mangrove forests and vast seagrass beds. So we have changed the lagoon. So the picture on the left is uh, Port St. Lucie uh, Inlet and all those white speckles are all the different houses and structures that are built and it really shows how we are really connected to all uh, the lagoon and specifically uh, we can have a major impact on the lagoon through our stormwater. And you will th you'll see that there are some things that don't seem like they're that big of a deal um, going into the lagoon, like different kinds of plant matter or sediment. Um, obviously, we know that trash and oil shouldn't go into the lagoon, but that's the natural things that we also have to worry about going into the lagoon in too much of a high abundance. Another thing that we do at the lagoon is we do an Indian River Lagoon report card. And this kind of shows the health of the lagoon, how it's changed over time, and how our uh, stormwater has impacted not only our water quality, but our seagrass health. And we are able to calculate this health report card um, by comparing observed values by regulatory standards and comparing them. And we do this so that the general community can get an idea about what the lagoon is like. So in 2016, we had that huge algae bloom that resulted in a very large fish kill. And so you can see that each, this is the north portion of the lagoon, and you can see that each one of these dots is an obser observation point. And then you, we extrapolate out those points to different areas so that we get an average of the entire area. Um, and the grays are going to be areas where there was no data. And so obviously green is going to be very good all the way down to red, very poor. So basically kind of think of it as like your A versus your F. And so in 2016, we had a very large algae bloom, which resulted in very poor water quality scores. In 2017, we saw some great improvement. Uh, you can see that things aren't necessarily in the very poor area. We're starting to get into some average water quality, which is awesome. This is the southern portion of the lagoon. You can see the south part of Brevard County right here. And you can see that it wasn't so great up in the northern portion by Melbourne, but the water quality was definitely doing a lot better towards the southern portion of the lagoon. And that was in 2016 during the large algae bloom that we had up in the north portion of the lagoon. Whereas in 2017, you can see that things definitely started to improve. 
Um, and so we own so far from this posting, we only have the data up to 2017. However, we have just gotten the new data, so we should be updating our report card. We have data all the way up until 2019, and uh, Dr. Lisa Soto would be pre uh, presenting the new data on National Estuaries Day on September 26th. So stay tuned for that information. In regards to our seagrass scores, now those are definitely suffering a lot more uh, due to the algae bloom. Um, it can and different uh, clouding of the water can prevent sunlight pre uh, to uh, excuse me can prevent uh, sunlight from penetrating through the water and enabling the seagrass to photosynthesize. Additionally, when there's a mass loss of oxygen in the water, our algae dies, starts to decompose, all the oxygen gets pulled from the water, our seagrasses are going to die as well. And again, this is the north portion of the lagoon. You can see the Mosquito Lagoon, you can see the Banana River, and the north portion of the Indian River. And you can see it's all doing very extremely poor for the most part. We didn't have too much of an improvement uh, in 2017. However, you do see some areas look like they are doing a little bit better, kind of by Titusville and a couple of points around the Banana River. Um, so hopefully we'll see some better improvement uh, in our new data, which we posted um, in September. In the southern portion of the lagoon, our seagrass score is still not great. Some of them did minorly improve. So the great question overall, is the lagoon's health improving? So these folded lines are all the different dates um, or all the all the different data, oops, in um, one, all the different data throughout the time series. Whereas the dotted lines are the different trends, so like the averages of what we're seeing. So with water quality, you can see that it does go up and down over time. You know, we had a dip in 2011 and then we had a big dip in 2016. Uh, and that's so the blue line is water quality, whereas the green line is seagrass health. And so you can see that it did seem like it was recovering a bit. And then going along with water quality, it did drop, recover a little bit, and then significantly dropped. So overall, water quality looks like it is kind of stable. Not necessarily at the saved level, but it is stable, whereas seagrass is kind of on the downward decline. So the question is the health improving? How can I help? How do I make a difference? One of the easiest things you can do is you can become Lagoon Loyal. Um, this is a, an awareness campaign uh, with Brevard County, and it is just geared to raise awareness and to encourage um, people in Brevard County to do positive actions to help improve the lagoon, um, such as uh, attending this workshop. And um, you can get points that you can exchange uh, for prizes with local businesses in and around the Indian River Lagoon. Another thing you can do is skip fertilizer. Um, we are still in a fertilizer ban for lawn fertilizer that contains nitrogen. So from June 1st to September 30th, you are not supposed to apply any fertilizer that has nitrogen in it. And you are also not so, 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 supposed to apply it within 10 feet of water. Grass clippings. So like how I talked about natural causes, uh, natural items can really cause a great impact into the lagoon. Um, grass is one of the major contributors to excess nutrients in the lagoon. Uh, and there's different things that you can do to reuse your grass clippings. You can use them as lawn fertilizer, just blowing them back onto your lawn and not down storm drains. You can also use them as mulch for garden beds, kind of protect that dirt, that soil from losing its moisture. Um, and you can also use it as compost material. Like I said, it's full of nutrients. Grass is really great at sucking up nutrients um, from the soil and when it dies, it's just going to maintain that nutrients. Um, so if you compost it or blow it back onto your yard, uh, it'll make a major impact in reducing your uh, the, uh, nutrients into the lagoon. Another thing you can do is hire 
responsible professionals. So, um, and these are the kind of lawn care professionals who divert mower shoots away from permeable surfaces and waterways. Um, they're going to blow the grass clippings back into the yard and they're not going to apply fertilizers and pesticides um, only when it's needed, not in excess. Another thing you can do is just simply pick up after your pet. There are 102 tons of dog waste left in the lagoon watershed every day. And that is more than the space shuttle. And dog waste contains harmful bacteria and parasites. A lot of people ask, you know, well, it's natural, so why should I pick up after my pet? Well, that bacteria and parasites can get into your groundwater, it can get into our rivers and streams, um, so it's really important to pick up after your pet. Another thing you can do is plant Florida-friendly plants. These are all native Florida plants, and by planting native Florida plants, they're adapted to our environment and they provide a lot of great habitat for our native organisms. There we have our sea grape leaf. And a fun fact about those is that you can actually write a letter on it, stick a posted, uh, post stamp on it, and you can mail it. Uh, you can also start your own mangrove nursery. These are different mangrove propagules that you can find along the shoreline. And they have different ways of being uh, grown out, which I will talk about in our next presentation on September 12th. Um, but it's a super easy way to make a great impact in rest restoring the Indian River Lagoon. You can also wash the car right. Um, commercial car washes must dis properly dispose of the wastewater. Um, a lot of people do like to wash their cars at home, which is totally fine. Uh, we just ask that you try to wash your car on the grass um, or on the gravel so that it has time to kind of uh, filter through the water, uh, filter through different sediments and kind of trap those chemicals in the soaps. Um, so the main goal of that is to prevent soap from entering the storm drains. And these are the markers that we will be placing uh, in the neighborhoods around the city of Melbourne. So if you're interested in um, placing storm drains and help volunteering with us, that's what it'll look like. Um, you can also reduce your water use. Um, so just simply watering the grass less. Um, and if you must water, please don't water the sidewalk. And you can use a spray nozzle instead of just letting the hose run. Or you can use a rain barrel. All right, so that is what we are here to talk about today. I'm gonna check the questions. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so I will answer questions at the end of um, the presentation. Um, and just in case, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the webinar settings, um, all participants are muted um, and your videos are muted. So if you want to answer any or ask any questions, please submit them through the question and answer portion uh, or through the chat. All right, so this is a picture right off of our boardwalk at the Lagoon House, and that rainstorm was just epically frightening. And so I wanted to show you um, just like the monstrosity of the rain that we do get in Florida. There we go. All right, so it does rain a ton in Brevard County. Throughout the United States, uh, the average rainfall is only 38 inches per year, whereas in Brevard County, it's 54 inches per year, and that's a lot of rain. A 40 by 80 foot roof will produce over 100,000 gallons of rainwater runoff every single year. And the big problem with that is that we have removed our natural environments, like our trees, our native plants. We don't have as many mangroves. We don't have those, nat or, uh, those natural um, ecosystems that are capturing the rainwater and preventing the rain from entering the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and we don't, we're missing our filtration systems too. Um, and in the month of April, we, which is our lowest amount of rainfall, uh, throughout Brevard County, you can have a rain rainfall runoff of over 4,000 gallons, which is equivalent to 76 55 gallon rain barrels. So our rain barrels, if you have not already picked up your rain barrel, these are what our rain barrels look like. 
Um, they are 55 gallon food grade barrels uh, that we rinse out and scrub out um, before we um, give them to people. And we cut the entire tops off. There's some rain barrels that uh, We'll only have like a small little opening. Um, we cut the entire top off of our rain barrel one, so it's a lot easier for you to position it in different areas uh, around your house um, to capture rain. And two, um, to properly maintain your rain barrel, you need to be able to reach in there and clean it out if needed. And we have covered uh, the tops with mosquito netting. And we have attached the mosquito netting to the bear barrel uh, with a recycled bicycle tire. Um, and each time that you've picked up a barrel, you should receive extra uh, bicycle tires. If you do not, we will always have extra um, at our lagoon house and we're more than happy to provide you with as many as you need. Um, and then down here on the bottom, uh, right hand side of your screen you should be able to see that we have a three quarter inch spigot um, which works with most garden hoses. So when you're installing your rainbow barrel after you've already picked it up um, there's a couple of really important things to keep in mind. The first one is that you want to make sure that you're putting your rain barrel in proximity to your use location. You don't want to put your rain barrel somewhere where you're not going to use it or you're going to forget about it. If it's not in front of a window or you don't walk by it every day, you might want to consider a different spot. So you're like, oh yes, I need to use my rain barrel or oh, I need to do some maintenance on my barrel. Um, you also want to make sure that you're putting it in a good spot for the downspout um, or in a V in your roof. Um, and if possible, this isn't like a mandatory thing, but if possible, try to put it out of direct sunlight. Um, the reason being is that way you can use your water at any time of the day. Uh, if it does get afternoon sun, that water gets hot. And hot water and plants don't mix. So uh, you can see that we put our rain barrel system uh, right by our downspout, and we have them right next to our mangrove nursery. Next thing, once you have selected your spot, uh, you want to make sure that you have a solid level surface. And you can achieve this by getting some gravel and patting it down, um, or paving tiles, bricks, anything that is going to provide a nice stable platform. It doesn't have to be anything expensive or fancy. Rain barrels are simple, um, but you want to just make sure that it's nice and level. Let's say that your rain barrel is about halfway full. What happens if it tips over or somebody runs into it or a big windstorm? You know, it could possibly fall over. Um, and these things get really heavy uh, when they have water in them. So you want to make sure it's nice and stable. Um, and you can see that we have our bricks there. Um, the next thing you want to do is once you have your spot and your level surface, you want to make sure that you raise your elevation. Um, our, what we do with our rain barrels is about uh, two levels of cinder blocks with paving tiles on the top and the bottom, so kind of like a cinder block sandwich. Um, and we take our cinder blocks and we make them into a square spiral um, so that there isn't the weak spots next to each other, that they're all kind of like um, meshing well together like Tetris. Um, and this is just how we do it. Um, you know, we've seen people use different kinds of blocks, um, different kinds of concrete. It's totally up to you, whatever works best for you. Um, with the cinder block method and the paving tiles, you can get do them inexpensively for about $25. Um, or you can get pre-made stands from hardware retailers, and this can range anywhere from, where, from like $25 to hundreds of dollars, depending on how fancy you want to get. Um, we have had other uh, people who have purchased our rain barrels use wooden stands. Um, and this one right here, you can see that they have paving tiles and cinder blocks, paving tiles. Um, and then that right there is a half whiskey barrel cut in half. Um, and then they put the rain barrel on top of that, um, and then they have like ferns growing out of the whiskey barrel, um, which is awesome because that can help with uh, runoff. Uh, different, like if your rain barrel overflows, the plants there to kind of capture some more stuff. And the reason why we want to lift up our barrel is because the higher the barrel, the better the flow. 
Um, some people like to keep their barrel low because instead of using the spigot, they like to uh, dip into their barrel and that's totally fine. Um, other people like to use the spigot and raise it up higher. I just wanna check the chat really quick. Make sure I didn't miss anything. All right. And uh, by having your barrel higher, you're going to have a uh, better flow due to the increased gravity. Okay. All right. So um, the next thing that's also very important after you've raised your elevation is you want to either, two, two options, uh, adjust your downspout or, and slash or determine if you need an overflow hose or the diverter system. Um, you can see in this picture, we have adjusted our downspout. Um, and the reason being is because we have a huge system of rain barrels. I wanna say there's eight barrels over there in our rain barrel system. Um, and so that way we don't have to worry about our rain barrels ever overflowing because the water's just gonna transfer from one barrel to the next. Um, so if you decide to um, add barrels, um or have multiple barrels or if you're not too worried about your rain barrel overflowing during a heavy rain um you can use an adjustable downspout and so you want to make sure after you've built up your height the height that you want um you need to determine where you need to cut your downspout at um and determine if you're just going to straight cut it and it's just going to down um, or if you want to have a flexible downspout extension uh, and those are usually pretty inexpensive get a plastic one anywhere from five to twenty dollars uh, if you look on Amazon or if you go to a hardware store um, and you can simply cut your downspout with a hacksaw or tin snips um, hacksaws they're loud uh, but they do work pretty well um, and then some of the downspouts will just stick right on uh, pretty solidly um, others you might need to use metal screws or zip ties if needed um, and so uh, the second option is to determine if you need an overflow hose or a diverter system. And the reason why you need to determine this is if you need to direct your overflow away from the home, because those barrels do fill up rather quickly, um, or if you want to add additional rain barrels, or if you permanently want to just have a soaker hose kind of going. So this is an example of a uh it's kind of like a hybrid between adjusting your downspout and having a diverter system um you can see that here's the original downspout and here's the diverter system with a hose going down into your barrel uh, what i really like about these i think these are a great option for uh, household owners is because this diverter has like a little screen or like ledge over it so that uh leaves and stuff get trapped or like pushed over to the side so that leaves and other debris go down your downspout where the water goes into the barrel and once your barrel is full the water will get pushed up back that tube and down the downspout theoretically um, this right here is a diverter system from your barrel um, and so i know that the top isn't cut off in this one um, but the water would go into the top of the barrel fill up and then excess water once the barrel is full or has reached this point the water will go through this tube and away from your house and the reason why you want to have these diverter systems or a way of directing water away from your house is that so the water doesn't soak into your foundation and cause any issues so here are two different schematics of a rain barrel setup um, you can see that this one has that downspout diverter into the barrel um, and then it has a downspout going away from the house um, whereas this one on the right hand side is a barrel chain where you, um, they have the connector um, from the diverter from the barrel to their next barrel to the next barrel and this is a great option if you have a large roof um, if you do a lot of gardening and you want to just water your plants or your yards with your barrels um, because I feel like rain barrels are kind of like potato chips. You can't just have one, you end up buying more than one um, just because it's amazing how much water fills up in these barrels. 
Um, and so these are kind of like real life versions of the schematic I just showed. Uh, you can see the water going into the barrels. They have their diverter system on the lower end, um, and then they have the hose running off to the outside. And you can see that they did use a wooden structure um, that looks like it's pretty solidly built. Um, so that's another option you can look into. Whereas here, this is our uh, rain barrel system um, that I showed earlier. This is just the front half of it. And you can see that we have three hoses going off of it um, because we have a ton of mangroves that we water um, all the time. Um, if you do decide to have a larger system of rain barrels and you want to connect them, you want to make sure that your connector is kind of on the larger side. Um, one, this is in case like debris gets into it and you don't want to clog your system. And two, so that water will flow from one barrel into the next. If it's too tight, it might be difficult for the water to flow. Uh, and by tight, I mean like too small of an opening. So once you have installed your rain barrel, um, we also want to stress the importance of maintenance. And different maintenance includes uh, draining your barrel monthly if it's not regularly used. Um, that's because you don't want stagnant water. This will help with your algae growth in your barrel, especially if it's in a uh, place that gets regular sunlight. You want to make sure that you're also keeping your gutters clean uh, if you have gutters. So going through getting out the leaves, uh, any kind of sediment. Um, and if your gutters stay more clean, that means your barrel's going to stay more clean. Your barrel's more clean, then your spigot's not going to get clogged. Um, if you have issues with algae growth, this does happen occasionally. You know, it depends on your location, the sunlight, that kind of thing. Um, you want to make sure that you dump your barrel, rinse it with fresh water, and then throw in a small cap full of bleach. It doesn't have to be a lot, just enough to um, kind of deter the growth of algae. And then uh, about once a year or so, you want to check for leaks. Um, we use um, P PVC cement. There we go. Wait. Yeah, PVC cement. Um, and, you know, we glue them really, really well. Um, but just in case if there's any damage to your barrel, uh, you want to use aquarium clock. And then uh, once a year, we always ask you to drain, rinse, scrub your barrel with either soap and water or bleach and then let it dry. That'll kill anything that's on it if there's any kind of like microorganisms, algae, um, and it'll just be kind of good maintenance to keep your barrel water good and fresh. And there's lots of different things that you can use uh, for rain barrel water for. Um, obviously, you know, watering uh, grass and flowers, watering house plants, either out in your yard or any kind of potted plants, um, as well as in your house. You can easily fill up a watering can and then walk inside and water any kind of house plants you have. Uh, you can also use this rainwater for filling bird baths, dog pools, or your pond. Uh, I recently spoke to a gentleman who had set up his rain barrel and then he used his diverter hose to fill his pond, which was really cool. You can also use your rain barrel water for uh, washing your car. Um, just remember to please wash your car on the grass or the gravel if need be. Um, and then we do get questions, can you water your vegetable or herb gardens with your rain barrel water? That's a tough one. So there is a study that was conducted by Rutgers. Um, I want to say it was 2015. Um, and they did find that it was all right to use uh, your rain barrel water on your fruits and vegetables um, if you use a 3% bleach solution. Um, so that means you want to have bleach in your water. So that means you don't want to use it for maybe some other items. Uh, might not be good to use for like your dog's water or anything like that. Um, but you'll want to use about one ounce of bleach for about a 55 gallon rain barrel. And you want to make sure that when you're using this water that you're applying it to the soil of the vegetable gardens, not the plants. You don't want to put the water on top of the leaves in case if there is anything bad in your water, um, the plant doesn't uh, open its pores and absorb that in just in case. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're applying water in the morning directly to the soil so that it has a chance to be UV sterilized. Um, 
one thing that you don't want, if you have a copper roof, or if you have a roof that has been treated with mold or mildew treatment, uh, you do not want to use that for watering your plants, and that's due to different uh, compounds that can get into your water and cause issues once you eat the plants. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. Um, but if you have not picked up your rain barrel um, or you have not notified me where you would like your rain barrel to be picked up, um, please let me know if you would like to pick it up at Rockledge Gardens or if you would like to pick it up at the Lagoon House. Uh, Rockledge Gardens is obviously located off of Highway 1 in Rockledge um, and they're open Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so we will be dropping off additional uh, rain barrels on Sunday. Um, if you have gone and they're like, oh no, we're out of barrels, we will have more on Sunday. Um, and then if you want to come by the Lagoon House, we are open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. We are closed to the public, but we are staffed. Um, so just give us a call to make sure that we are ready to receive you. Um, and if you're still kind of hesitant about purchasing a rain barrel or you're not sure, um, we always have additional rain barrels for sale through our online gift shop. Um, so the Lagoon unites us all. Thank you. Um, and one more thing, uh, attending this presentation, you can earn points for Lagoon Loyal simply by signing up at lagoonloyal.com slash uh, sign up. And then scanning this with your phone, if you just scan it, scan it with your camera app, it'll open right up and you'll be able to accrue points uh, to Lagoon Loyal. So I will go through and check the chat and the questions right now. Let's see. I will leave this up so you should be able to still scan it. If you can't, please notify me. Uh, I'm going to check the questions. Uh, okay. And then, so I will definitely get to those and I'm just going to check the chat really quick. Oh, okay, I'll check. I'll do the questions first and then I'll do the chat. Oh, here we go. Here's our chat. All right. Uh, okay. Um, let's see. One thing. So yes, uh, the presentation will be available as a recording later. We will post it to our website by sometime early next week. Um, and then there was a question about what if I have gutters? Uh, if you could please elaborate on that question uh, the, to the person who had submitted that through the webinar chat. Um, and one more thing to add is that um, to once you have used our uh, once you have used the rain um, from your barrel or if you aren't using it regularly um, please do so because it's very important that we're draining out our barrels so that we're capturing our runoff from our roofs and our houses um, so that we're decreasing our impact on stormwater pollution so the first question i have over here um, through our q a is how is the fertilizer ban enforced um, what if we do if a neighbor is utilizing fertilizer? Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, our fertilizer ban is not fully enforced. We don't have like a great enforcement team uh, so far. Um, however, what you can do is that you can bring it up to uh, the um, National Resources Management Office at Brevard County um, and you can ask them uh, what is the best way to um, share information uh, with the neighbor to encourage them to not use fertilizer uh, during the fertilizer ban. Um, and it's possible maybe they're fertilizing with something that doesn't have nitrogen in it. Um, I think there is there can be some confusion that people can actually still fertilize during this time. They just cannot fertilize with fertilizer that contains nitrogen. Um, where do we find a list of Florida friendly plants? Um, the Florida Native Plant Society has an excellent website uh, where you can go online and you can check out different plants for your yard. Um, and you can also check out different plants that attract pollinators um, and where they do better, if they do better in full sun, less sun, a lot of water, less water, that kind of thing. Um, also, Rockledge Gardens, you know, they have a fantastic selection of native plants, um, and I know that everyone there is always super friendly and 
very willing to help people uh, select out plants, plant native plants that are great uh, for their yard. Um, the next question is, is there any reason that Palm Bay doesn't offer an incentive? Um, it's one of those things that it just hasn't happened yet with the city of Palm Bay. Um, we have done some discussions with them, but then there was a changing of um, staff. Um, and so uh, that hasn't happened yet, but hopefully in the coming year, uh, we will have, hopefully, I mean, I can't guarantee anything because uh, it's definitely a city on Palm Bay. Um, so it's up to them if they would like to do it. Um, and if they do, we are more than happy to um, assist. All right, next question. How do we get a rebate from the city of Coco? Um, so if you Google uh, the city of Coco uh, rain barrel rebate program, um, there is a list actually, I think that I can share this. Um, I will have uh, the rebate requirements for the City of Cocoa and the City of Melbourne posted to our website underneath this presentation um, so that you can check to see if you qualify. Uh, both cities have different requirements, um, but both do require you to be on who was it, uh, whichever is water um, and you have to submit pictures and like a small application um, so that you get your different rebates. Uh, City of Cocoa is I believe $100 off of your water bill, where City of Melbourne is a $50 check. Um, however, these rebate, rebates are specifically through the different cities. We just promote them. Um, I can make a PDF of the slides for future reference um, if people prefer the PDF so you can just scan it and not have to like listen to this entire presentation. Um, I'll make sure that I get a PDF also posted um, with this uh, recorded presentation. Um, and so I kind of mentioned that for the rebates for each city. Um, if you have more questions about the rebates, I definitely recommend just Googling City of Melbourne Rain Barrel Rebate Program or City of Cocoa Rain Barrel Rebate Program. Um, both are pretty uh, easy to find um, and they'll have more complete information for you than I will be able to provide. Um, and if you have just created a Lagoon Loyal account, and um, if you scan this, everybody should still be able to see my screen. So I still have the Lagoon Loyal um, uh, poster up. So if you scan it, it should open and you should be able to accrue your points. Um, just make sure that you are uh, not in private browsing mode because otherwise it won't. Uh, connect from your scan to your account. Okay. Can you use the water to add to your pool? Um, I don't see why not. You know, um, you're treating your water in your pool already because you have your filtration systems um, and you're going to have your chemical treatments in your pool. So I think using your rainwater in your pool should probably be just fine. However, I'm not a pool expert. Um, so you might want to touch base with if you have a pool maintenance a person or a pool supply uh, store, they might have a better answer than I do. Um, but I do think that you can use your pool or your rain barrel water to uh, water, add water to your pool. So, um, and if you're happy, so if you've created a Lagoon Loyal account, um, then go into your phone and start your camera application and just uh, put the QR code in line with your camera and it should say like open in safari or open in google chrome um i'll put this in slideshow so you can see it a little bit better um just make there we go okay so um if you still have issues um be more than happy to answer the questions about using the lagoon loyal um application and scanning uh, the qr code okay 
how do I reach you? Um, you can let me know where you would like to pick up your rain barrel, either through the chat, because um, I'll be reviewing it, making sure I didn't miss anything. Um, and if, or so you can either send it through the chat or you can email me at Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at M-R-C-I-R-L dot org um, to let me know where you would like to pick up your rain barrel. Um, another question is, is it possible to use the rain barrel system with a sprinkler system? I do know that there are people who have used uh, sprinkler, sprinkler hoses. Um, so they're kind of like those soaker hoses, but they have the little spritz of water that go up out of them. I do know that that works. Um, I would just make sure that your rain barrel is lifted up um, pretty decently so that the, uh, the water can flow through the hose pretty well. Um, and I know that they sell soaker hoses slash sprinkler hoses that work really well with our barrels at Walmart as well as Ace Hardware. Um, if you just look for, I believe it's just like the regular soaker hoses. I think they're pretty uh, standard. All right, so I'm checking the chat. Now I've completed all the Q&A questions. Um, another, one of the last questions is what type of roofing material uh, is not good for watering edible plants? And that's copper, um, just because as the water, if there's any kind of like pollution up in the sky um, and it lands on the copper roof, um, there could be chemical reactions with different compounds in the water um, that can cause uh, issues um, that you don't want to consume. Um, and uh, roofs that have been recently treated with uh, mold or mildew uh, repellent or treatment. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't have a ton of chemicals already on your roof. Um, and then, cool. if anybody has any other questions, we have a few more minutes, um, but I just want to say thank you so much again for Rockledge Gardens for promoting our event, um, as well as Ace Hardware of West Melbourne, who's been a huge sponsor throughout the years with our Rain Barrel Project, um, as well as Bob's Bicycles for provi providing our reusable bicycle tires. Um, and a major thank you to uh, Dennis Mayo, who is our rain barrel champion um, and works really hard with them all, um, as well as Cocoa Utility customers and City of Melbourne uh, rain, uh, utilities customers as well. All right, any other questions? Um, I will move this on. So if anybody needs my email or wants to look us up online, there's our website, www www.savetheirl.org, um, as well as our my email. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any additional questions you have about rain barrels or rainwater usage, um, and any questions about the lagoon. Um, again, please, if you have not already done so, please email me or message it in the chat where you would like to pick up your rain barrel at, so that we make sure that Rockless Gardens is fully stocked with enough rain barrels. Alrighty. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Right. Oh,